God's peace to you, friends. It's good to be with you again. I am Pastor Alan Rose now, uh, one of the two pastors here at Shepherd of the Desert. And it's my privilege to bring you the Word of God today. Uh, you know, here at Shepherd of the Desert, our mission statement is leading people to follow Jesus. And so each Sunday as we examine a certain portion of the Bible, we're asking the question, how does this text help us to follow Jesus? That's what it's all about. Today's scripture text is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5, verses 13 through 16. These are the words of Jesus. He said, you, plural, all of you, are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Let's dig into these words this morning and ask God to help us grasp the import of them. Jesus spoke these words as part of his well-known Sermon on the Mount that he delivered up in Galilee in the northern part of Israel. And uh, in this particular portion of his sermon, he uses two major metaphors in his teaching, salt and light. We want to explore what he's talking about in those metaphors. He says that his followers are the salt of the earth and the light of the world. So let's dig into these. First of all, what does Jesus mean by calling his followers the salt of the earth? salt of the earth. We're all, of course, quite familiar with salt. We probably intake some salt virtually every day. And while we're warned not to take in too much salt, we also know we have to have some in order to truly be healthy physically. Well, in looking at, uh, at the words of Jesus here, I think it helps to understand something about the significance of salt uh, back in biblical times. We need to understand that salt was one of the most highly valued treasures of the ancient world. In fact, early trade routes and many of the very first roads were established for the transportation of salt from one land to another. In fact, in Roman times, Roman legions sometimes used salt as currency. That's how valuable salt was back in those days. Now, salt, in terms of its uses, uh, share some similarity to today. Certainly, salt back then was also used as a season for foods to make it more tasty, flavorful, uh, make foods more appetizing. But definitely the most important use of salt back in ancient times was for the preservation of meat and fish. We need to keep in mind, of course, that for most of human history, there was no refrigeration system like we have today. And the way that you preserved meat was to pack it in salt. And that would, that would help ward off the effects of corruption and decay. So salt was a preservative against such corruption. Now, Jesus turns to his followers and he says to them and to you and to me today, you are the salt of the earth. What does he mean? Well, think of it this way. Through your faith connection to Jesus Christ as your Savior, you and I are, are to have a preserving effect on the world around us. We're to have an impact in our spheres of influence for the good in opposition to corruption and decay as we see it around us. And you know, we don't have to look very far in society to see the corruption, to see the moral decay. 
to see the ways humankind has strayed away from the ways of God. I mean, going all the way back to Adam and Eve, sin has had its grotesque effect on our world. Corruption seems to be everywhere. Violence seems to be growing more and more. We see abuse, one person to another, hatred on the rise. We also have a sense of hopelessness growing in our society. I was reading recently about the growing percentage of veterans who are committing suicide and the growing number of teenagers who have reached such a sense of despair that they see no future for themselves and they're taking their lives. Really tragic. Well, our calling as followers of Jesus is, among other things, to be the salt of the earth. That is, we are to be a preserving influence in the world for what is good in opposition to the corruption. When I talk about examples of this, I, I, I can't help but think about the example of my own mother. And one particular incident stands out in my mind. I will never forget this. It goes all the way back to when I was in high school. And it was a school day, and I was in the car with my mom and a couple of my siblings, and we were going down the road on the way to school. And as was common back then, the car radio was on playing the local radio station of secular music. We, we listened to songs on the way to school. And as we're going along, a song came on the radio, and some of you may remember Stephen Stills' song, uh, Love the one you're with. Anybody remember that song from the 70s? Okay, I know I'm old here, all right. Back in the <clears throat> days of classic rock, yes. All right, Stephen Stills came out with this song called Love the One You're With. And the words of the song talk about, you know, if you, if, uh, you have someone you love, but you're, you're far away from that person, but there's someone who's really attractive near you, just love the one you're with. And the song gets done, and my mom says, I don't like that song. <laughs> and my brother says, how come? And she goes on to say, well, it's basically telling me that if, if I'm away from where your dad is, and I'm near somebody else, that I should love another man instead of your dad. And that would be wrong. We all kind of went, Wow. I tell you, that has stuck with me. In that moment, my mom was the salt of the earth to her children. She was having a preserving effect on our little hearts and souls and minds as she taught us a lesson about commitment in marriage. She was always faithful to my dad and my dad to her. And they were a wonderful example of commitment under Christ. I'll never forget that example. She was the salt of the earth to us. So let me ask you a question. How will you be the salt of the earth in your spheres of influence wherever you go? What preserving effect will you have on the people around you? And you know, it's really not optional for the follower of Jesus. The Lord even points out the absurdity of there being something like unsalty salt. I, I think we see the humor of Jesus in, in these words when he says, but if the salt loses its saltiness, you can almost hear him chuckling as he says this, how can it be made salty again? That's absurd. Unsalty salt? No. No. And if you follow Jesus... You are the salt of the earth. You're to have a preserving effect wherever you go. And then after calling his followers salt, Jesus then changes metaphors. And he says to his disciples, you are the light of the world. The light of the world. Now, if you're familiar with the rest of Jesus' teachings, this one may sound a little bit strange. After all, in John chapter 8, verse 12, we, we hear Jesus saying of himself, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. 
There, Jesus said that he is the light of the world. But now in this text, he says, you are the light of the world. What do we make of that? In what sense are we the light of the world? Well, let me use another illustration. Consider for a moment the relationship between the sun and the moon. By the way, did anybody get up in the middle of the night last night, go outside and look at that super moon last night? Anybody? We had one in the early service who got up about 12, 30, 1 o'clock in the morning, went outside. Yeah, it was that super bright full moon last night. Just amazing. But, you know, if you think about the relationship between the sun and the moon, as bright as the moon was last night, its light is a reflected light. It doesn't originate with the moon. Of course, it originates with the sun shining on it. And I think that maybe lends a little bit of uh, insight into some of what Jesus is saying here. The light originates with the sun. And Jesus says to you and me, you are the light of the world. We reflect the true light, the light of the Son of God. Jesus Christ. And of course, that true light that shines upon us originates on a hill outside of Jerusalem where Jesus, the Son of God, laid out His life on a cross for you and me. Oh yes, a very crude and rugged and ugly wooden cross, an implement of execution. But a cross that shines as an emblem of the love of God for people like you and me, as Jesus gives his life as payment for my sins, your sins, all people's sins, for all the times that we've been part of the corruption and the decay in the world, for all the times that we've lived in the darkness instead of the light, Jesus died for all of it. And by his death and resurrection, through faith in Him, our sins are wiped away. We have the promise of eternal life awaiting us in heaven. And beyond that, in this life right now, we have a reason to live with joy and hope and certainty, purpose and meaning, and with a mission. And to illustrate further what Jesus means, He goes on and He uses two other metaphors related to the light. First, he says, a city built on a hill cannot be hidden. A city built on a hill cannot be hidden. Now, the illustration here is an obvious one, isn't, isn't it? A city on a hilltop is very visible by everyone who's looking up at it from below. In the daytime, the, the buildings of the city are visible, and by nighttime, you can observe the lights shining down from that city. And so, too, the life of a follower of Jesus is one that is noticed by other people. Because the light of Christ has shone on us and we reflect that light, our faith is evident to the world around us. We can't help but be noticed as the light of the world. Next, Jesus says, neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. Now, the lamp that Jesus has in mind here probably looked a lot like this next picture. That's a typical clay oil lamp from the first century. The oil lamp uh, worked this way. You poured olive oil into the hole in the center of the lamp, you put a little wick in the little hole on the end and lit it, and it would burn for a period of time as long as there was oil in the lamp. You would have these around your house. You could carry them room to room. Of course, this is long before the uh, uh, discovery of uh, harnessing electricity, so this was your lighting system for centuries. This was the common way that you had light in your house, little oil lamps. Now listen again to what Jesus says. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. 
Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. Now, I think once again here, we hear the humor of Jesus. You know, again, this is his Sermon on the Mount. He's talking to this whole crowd of people. I can see Jesus kind of chuckling as he's telling this little illustration. You know, who, who lights a lamp and puts a bowl over it? You know, the whole crowd, I think, probably chuckled. Yeah, who would ever do that? That's ridiculous. No one would do that. Of course not. Instead, of course, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. That's what you do with a lamp. And now comes the real-life application that Jesus wants his followers to take with them. Jesus says, in the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Let your light shine before others. So they see what you do, and they give glory to God. Let it shine. You see, as we serve people lovingly in the name of Christ Jesus, reflecting the light of His love that shines upon us, what we end up doing is pointing people to the one who truly is worthy of praise and honor, God our Heavenly Father. And part of our calling as followers of Jesus is to live in such a way that people will be drawn to the love of God. So let me ask you, how might you let your light shine this week? How might the light that has shone upon you in Christ your Savior be reflected in such a way that you are that super moon to the people around you? How might you let it shine in your various vocations? How might you let your light shine at work among your your co-workers on the job? How might you let your light shine at school as a student when maybe some other students are promoting the, the ways of the world and the corruption that this world holds? How will you shine the light of truth and do it in a loving way? How will you let your light shine at the gym, on the golf course, at the spa or the salon in the neighborhood? How will you let the light shine in your own home, among your own family members, in your own marriage? How will you let your light shine among friends and, yes, even among your enemies? How will you let your light shine? Across the street from our Shea campus, On the south side of Shea Boulevard, there's a shopping center right there. And in that shopping center, there are at least four eating establishments. I encourage you to patronize those establishments. They're good neighbors of ours. But they have interesting names. Maybe you've been to some of these. Ling and Louie's. Anybody been to Ling and Louie's? Asian? Yeah, that's a yummy place. Ling and Louie's. There's S&V, used to be Stone and Vine. Anybody been to S&V? Italian, urban, yummy food. Scoop and Joy, ice cream place, Scoop and Joy, and Salt and Lime, Mexican Grill. Anybody been to Salt and Lime? Yeah? Yeah, interesting names. Ling and Louis, S&V, Scoop and Joy, Salt and Lime. My prayer is that without having to put up any kind of a sign, Shepherd of the Desert will be known by both salt and light. And how is that going to happen in this community? It doesn't happen by putting up a big billboard. You know how it happens? It happens as each one of us lives out, lives out Jesus' words to us in this text wherever we go. It happens as each one of us is the salt of the earth. You are the salt of the earth, friends, so be that preserving influence against corruption and decay and bring good into the world around you. And you are the light of the world, so let it shine all the time, all around the neighborhood. Let it shine. Amen.